to bring up the co-director of the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research at University of California, San Diego, um, Dr. Atkinson. Thanks for the kind introduction. It's wonderful to be here. I can, uh, just as I was about to have everything launched, I somehow got into a predicament where I can't get the slides to show. So, once my incompetence is revealed and the slides can come up, <laughs> I'll talk to you a bit about uh, informally, and so please uh, feel free to ask questions. I'd, uh, uh, here's a, what I'd planned was simply to review the, uh, uh, the history of uh, how the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research at the uh, University of California was formed. Uh, just a bit of the background and then go through our findings. Uh, we commenced in the year 2000 and then uh, have just concluded our, our last uh, uh, study this past December. So um, a little bit about uh, our history, uh, the approval process for conducting this kind of research, and then I'll just present the, the main findings of the center um, uh, and then try to update a little bit on uh, on where do we go from here. Is that kind of what you had in mind? Yes. All right, yes. all right. Um, can I get out of the way okay? Uh, <laughs> um, can everyone see around me or through me enough to start? Okay, so um, just by, by way of uh, backgrounds in the run-up to the, uh, uh, the uh, initiation of the CMCR, the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. Of course, in the late 90s, there was a great uh, scientific uh, reawakening uh, in interest in medicinal cannabis. Uh, you know, part of it was because these anecdotal reports of its health benefits just wouldn't go away. And uh, second was that uh, there was some flexibility and that some states began to consider the, the, uh, the, uh, the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. And then on the scientific front, um, the, uh, this inbuilt natural endocannabinoid system uh, was discovered and it was noted that there were uh, cannabinoid 1 and cannabinoid 2 receptors, one in the brain and one mostly in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, it was noted that uh, anandamide uh, was a natural uh, neurotransmitter that, uh, uh, that THC happened to also attach to the same receptor sites. And then there were the um, uh, development of uh, synthetic molecules uh, THC itself was synthesized and then other molecules involved in the metabolism of THC and, and similar signaling. So um, just as a, a quick review then, in terms of function, this CB1 receptor is, uh, uh, has uh, a, a huge range of functions that range from you know, basics like uh, memory and learning and appetitive behavior that is uh, Sucklings and newborn rodents uh, need that CB1 receptor, or you just don't have that appetite behavior to start feeding yourself or being fed. Uh, and then there was it's also uh, the CB1 receptor also very important for uh, uh, time sense, uh, uh, attention to spatial memory. Uh, uh, reward mechanisms in the brain, and then also a very high level executive functions like so synthesis, planning, abstraction, appreciation of, of, uh, uh, of the world around us and the on only the way that we, we can do, we think. So um, not only is there a lot of uh, functional attributes of the CB1 receptor, but it's very widespread as you can see. You're really at key elements all over the brain from the, uh, the cortex where we do our thinking to the basal ganglia where we have our motor activities centered 
um, hippocampus important for memory. So you can see how widespread uh, this uh, this uh, endocannabinoid system is and how crucial it is uh, uh, for uh, for mental processing. So. Um, uh, right before the CMCR was initiated, there were a series of studies um, at the Institute of Me Medicine in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the National Institute of Health that seemed to indicate that there was reason to study uh, medical marijuana for its potential role in uh, 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 appetite enhancement for pe people with, uh, with cancer or HIV infection to suppress nausea and vomiting and chemotherapy, uh, for pain relief, and also for uh, control of muscle spasm and pain in uh, multiple sclerosis. And these targets were identified by these very uh, prestigious panels. So uh, the center itself, uh, uh, of course, had a, a, a legal background in Prop 215. Uh, and then in 1999, the Medical Marijuana Research Act uh, was spearheaded by a, a very visionary senator, Senator John Vasconcelos, who said, uh, well, listen, we've approved the use of, of medical marijuana. Um, really, what, what's the evidence? What, what's the evidence that it really works for anything on a scientific basis? And so, in a, in a, uh, uh, that was the origin of this uh, Medical Marijuana Research Act that uh, ultimately uh, uh, led to 10 years of uh, funding for the CMCR to do its work. Um, so we had a mission, and, and the mission was to do the scientific research of the highest quality and to collaborate with uh, federal, uh, state, and, uh, and local entities and other academic centers uh, in the conduct of this research. Um, we, we thought there might be three stages to our work. One was simply to uh, uh, study smoked cannabis because that's what the legislation said. They didn't want synthetic marijuana. Uh, they were, uh, wanted marijuana cigarettes. And so that was uh, what we were ha what we were going to use as our as our treatment vehicle. Uh, and then we were uh, one other uh, because of the hazards and the questions about inhaling combusted material, smoking that is. Uh, we were also given some leeway to study uh, 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 the delivery of uh, a cannabis by vaporized methods. And then finally, uh, uh, we had hoped to. Uh, pr uh, proceed to stage three, which is really a more of a pharmaceutical uh, approach to the cannabinoids. So um, I, I won't belabor this point, but I did. Uh, I just wanted to show you the uh, the process that we went through for the approval of each and every one of these studies. We we ended up mounting about 15 different studies, and each of them had to go through this approval process. So the the CMCR was given money to solicit uh, other academic and private uh, public centers to uh, send us research proposals. And we formed a scientific review panel of nationally and internationally renowned scientists who would review each of the, uh, 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 each of the studies. And uh, so up in the very left, left hand corner of the slide, you'll see this uh, scientific review board, SRB, review. So they, uh, uh, they made comments back to uh, uh, the scientists and uh, helped them improve their protocol. And then after it was approved by our scientific review board, it went to the California Research Advisory pan Panel. Uh, and they made their comments on our research proposals. And then from there it went to the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, uh, the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and then finally after this scientific review, yes? Will the volume go up? Will it go up? Is this better? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, after there was a scientific review, then the, the uh, a drug enforcement agency would come to each of the research sites. We had to do all our work in a clinical research center in the hospital itself, and they had to be sure we had adequate custody and chain of command of the, the cannabis. And now we got our cannabis um, from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. 
they have a contract with the University of, uh, of Mississippi and they have a, a, a giant farm where they investigate botanical uh, uh, agents of all sorts for therapeutic uses and cannabis was one of them so we would uh, uh, we would order once this the scientists said what the strength of cannabis cigarettes they wanted they would make up the uh, the cigarettes for the protocol and then ship them to the scientists and they also um, okay so we also uh, needed to have uh, in any research of a therapeutic intervention, particularly since we focused on pain, you have to have uh, placebo cigarettes. That is, cigarettes that uh, smell like the real thing, taste like the real thing, but from which the THC has been leached out. Uh, and that's our control, simply because, particularly for pain, um, about one out of every three people has a, uh, a brain system that can turn on very powerfully just with the act of being given a medication to take or a, in this case a placebo cigarette to smoke and they will suppress pain by about 30 to 50 percent. It's just a native ability of some individual's nervous system. There's a Nobel Prize there of course and but it you've got to be able to beat the placebo to say that you've done anything. So um, that was the and uh, the, f the first study took about a year and a half to get f for any individual studies to win their way through this process. Everyone was very cordial and very helpful, and, but it's just, just a lot of hoops. And, but by, uh, after several of these, we got it down to about a year per study. And um, we studied, uh, uh, focused primarily on a condition called neuropathic pain because that was one of the, uh, that's where the Institute of Medicine said that uh, probably had a very good chance of success. And neuropathic pain is uh, common in HIV disease, it's common in diabetes, uh, after injury to a nerve from a, say a car accident. So it's a disease of the nerves, of the nerves either centrally in, in the brain or in the peripheral nervous system, say the, particularly the feet uh, and the legs. It's a kind of a, a painful, tingling, abnormal sensation that just will not go away and, and it's, it's just very, very disturbing. Uh, and so, for example, maybe a, a quarter of people with diabetes will develop this condition, uh, maybe 20% of people with HIV infection. So it's, it's, it's just very, very common and, and very difficult to treat. doesn't respond very well to standard approaches. Uh, we also studied uh, muscle spasms and multiple sclerosis. Uh, we had protocols on, uh, uh, to, to help with um, uh, uh, cancer chemotherapy, nausea and vomiting, uh, and then a, a sprinkling of other studies with, as mentioned, with vaporized uh, rather than smoked cannabis. Um, yes? That, you don't think it anything like with Parkinson's disease, like the shape of No, we didn't study Parkinson's. Uh, uh, most of the work is actually, uh, uh, has been done with multiple sclerosis, particularly in, uh, in Great Britain and the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and so that's, we, and there was some encouraging evidence there, so we, we took on that. Uh, um, Although we, we proposed some studies on um, uh, cancer chemotherapy, nausea, and vomiting, we closed those out after about a year or two each because they really couldn't recruit to the study. There were two problems. One is that you had to be in the hospital to, to participate in the research. And of course, if you have cancer, you spend enough time in a hospital, so you don't want to go to the hospital. And the second one was that the modern treatments for cancer chemotherapy were pretty good. And the final kind of uh, really telling argument was that um, for these studies, you couldn't have already been on cannabis. You had to be naive to it so we could test to see whether it worked. And nearly everybody who hadn't, who had failed on standard treatment had already taken up cannabis. So we just couldn't recruit anybody to those studies and sad to say, so there, we just close them down for non-performance. So, um, but, uh, we ended up with uh, study sites at, uh, at six places, um, uh, uh, UC San Francisco, UC Davis, uh, uh, a Stanford-affiliated hospital in San Mateo, 
uh, and then UCSD, uh, UCLA, and uh, uh, UC Irvine. So we had a nice distribution of scientists who applied for funding and, and were awarded work. So this is um, this slide is a bit busy, but it, it summarizes uh, ten years of work. Eh? Um, and you see, there's um, we have representative scientists from uh, five different UC uh, University of California sites. Uh, we studied a, a wide range of conditions uh, from pain that you induce in experimentally, and I'll explain a bit about that in normal volunteers, to uh, HIV neuropathy, neuropathy from diabetes, uh, and uh, uh, neuropathy from various kinds of injuries to the nervous system or other infections. So um, in the far right hand, you see the number, the N stands for the number of people in each trial. So um, these are all small sample studies, um, uh, what they call phase two trial. And of course in clinical trials, the bigger the better because the more people you have, the more it's chance you have to study a wider range of what the illness really is and what kind of people respond. The smaller the sample, the, the criticisms can be, well, you just got people who don't respond if your trial fails, or you just got people who are lucky enough they would have responded to lots of stuff. So um, the one liability is that, yep, these are all small studies, um, but clinical trials are expensive, and uh, I think we uh, we got a, a good bang for the buck out of each of these. And they're all, they're all short term, just a matter of, uh, of weeks. So we didn't do any longer term studies, no studies really over a month long. So all our results are based on you know, a small sample and uh, uh, a short term studies. <coughs> so just real quickly, I'll go over a couple of studies. Yes? I'm just gonna ask, are there any long term studies going on? Not in this country. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, Israel, the longest term study I know are in uh, the United Kingdom of multiple sclerosis, and they've gone, oh, 18 months to two years. Uh, yes. Israel, I know, uh, vaporizes in the hospital to the patient. Oh, yes, uh-huh, okay, yeah. They think we're really behind the equal. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Why is the percentage so low on THC? What's the percentage? I'll go over it. It's pretty low dose. We range Why most. Why is it so low? Why is it so low? Because uh, we thought, uh, on the one hand, we thought it would work just based on past reports to be at low dose, and we tried to study how much was just right and how much was too much. Yeah. And the other was that. Um, uh, many of the people who uh, had had some experience with cannabis who participated, but many didn't, and we wanted to keep the, the, uh, the psychological effects at a very low, some people get upset being high or uh, being agitated or anxious, and so the lower the dose, the, the fewer side effects. So. Um, so this is, we, we did one study just to start off with healthy college students, and uh, it's, it's uh, experimentally induced pain that's, uh, it's meant to mimic these neuropathic nerve injury pain. So what you do is you, uh, this is a person's skin, you take um, uh, capsaicin, which is the, the ingredient in the hot chili peppers, and you inject it under the individual's skin. And there is a, uh, of course, it's extremely painful, and uh, then the, and uh, uh, over a period of about say 20 to 30 minutes, you get a, something that really feels has that annoying, tingling, painful characteristics of the pain you get with diabetes or with HIV. So uh, it was a perfect model, and uh, um, we here we compared uh, placebo cigarettes and uh, uh, various doses of THC. So the left-hand panel shows that uh, uh, in blue is a placebo, and then green, orange, and purple are various concentrations of THC, ranging from about 2% to 7%. And you can see in the first 20 minutes, all those curves look just the same. They're, there's no difference. But if you get out to um, 
uh, about an hour uh, after the uh, individual smoked the uh, placebo or the cannabis cigarette, then you see some interesting separation. Um, and I, I thought one of the most interesting parts of it was that orange line is the, um, is the medium dose and it has the greatest reduction in pain intensity. Uh, the, uh, the low dose was just as no better than placebo and the high dose kind of made people report more pain. So it's just kind of an interesting idea that hey maybe for certain diseases or conditions there's just a there's a sweet spot. Uh, just a, a, a blood concentration that uh, does the job that you want it to be done with the fewest side effects. Um, now we also studied uh, um, uh, HIV neuropathic pain and uh, these are individuals at, uh, at San Francisco. Uh, as you see in kind of the left hand panel, they have a pain score that really goes from zero to 100. And all these people had uh, either AIDS or advanced HIV disease. They'd had uh, painful neuropathy in their, their feet and legs for on average of five to nine years. Uh, they came into the, uh, the hospital. Uh, spend a day kind of getting used to the environment and then we're asked to smoke uh, marijuana cigarettes or placebo cigarettes of different concentrations uh, and they did that for smoking uh, three times a day for five days and as you can see in the uh, the reddish orange line you get a very nice diminution of pain uh, over a five-day period uh, and uh, uh, placebo statistically much better than placebo does. So that was our, uh, that was our first study that suggested, I don't know how we lost this, but. Problem, all right. tried the uh, another uh, another investigator uh, uh, here at UCSD tr uh, tried a variation on that theme and so instead of giving one group of people placebo cigarettes and the other cannabis cigarettes um, they had at certain doses we asked people to uh, select a dose that they thought was most comfortable for them and we gave a person uh, first a, a 4% THC cigarette and if that was too much, they felt too high, then they could drop down. Uh, if they felt all right but no pain relief, they could go up to 8%. And so this kind of idea of the person is the best judge of, of what's right for them. And so then after a day of testing where they decided uh, what dose was good for them, then we, uh, 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 we tested its, uh, its effect. And Here there's a little squiggliness to the lines, but uh, 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 in this design, uh, each person either on, day, on random days will smoke uh, either placebo cigarette or, their, um, or the active cigarette. And it'll be in random order, and then you just test the pain relief on each day. So each person is their own kind of control or background. And, uh, here you see over time when people smoke cannabis cigarettes, the pain, the neuropathy pain was much less uh, and the placebo had a, had a minimal effect. And then um, we also studied the same, in the same kind of approach, we studied uh, neuropathic pain from diabetes and shingles and nerve injury. And here again, as you see, um, uh, in the uh, the red and the white lines, you get a nice reduction uh, 
uh, with cannabis as opposed to placebo cigarettes. So it looks like this, uh, uh, we got good results across a very nice uh, uh, range of studies. I don't know this light maybe. Uh, how, how did the results Oh, great. Let me just show that right now. I'll compare that. Yeah. I, um, is this showing up on the screen? Can you see this? Or, is it okay? <laughs> so there's this, uh, let me put up this bar graph. There's this uh, concept uh, in medicine called number needed to treat. And um, uh, we all know that uh, you give a treatment to someone and not everybody gets well. Some get, people get a little benefit, some people get some benefit, and some get a lot. And so the idea is uh, how, many, uh, uh, how many people do you have to treat with any one medication to get a real a dynamite result? And in, in pain, uh, dynamite is 30% pain relief, 30% reduction. Super dynamite is 50%. So, so we're, you, chronic pain is difficult to treat. Anyway, so um, if you look at the common treatments for <laughs> neuropathic pain, um, uh, one of them is, of course, of opioid, narcotic analgesics, and they have a number to treat someplace around 2.5. So for every two plus people you treat, one of them will have a very good result. Um, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, tricyclics were antidepressants from the 1960s. They still have pretty good depressive antidepressive effects, but they have in some instances very good pain relieving effects too for chronic neuropathic pain. And they, they weigh in at 2.2. Uh, at and there's cannabis is someplace between three and four people. One out of every three or four people will have a really a very, very good result. And that's a lot better than some of the standard anticonvulsants and some of the other antidepressants. So cannabis is, is holding up quite, quite nicely against these standard treatments. And the other thing about the standard treatments in our research is that to get into these protocols, uh, every, you had to have pain despite maximum standard therapy. So what we saw was we let everybody be on the medicines that they were on, the narcotic analgesics, the uh, uh, Tylenol, uh, anticonvulsants, antidepressants, whatever they were on, they stayed on. So the benefit was above and beyond what they could get from standard care. So we also did a study with uh, multiple sclerosis patients um, and uh, muscles to relieve muscle spasm. And here you see on the, uh, on the right hand side of the panel, you get a nice reduction in muscle spasm from, uh, from cannabis as opposed to uh, placebo cigarettes. And here again, the dose is around uh, nearly two to to six percent uh, THC, and uh, um, and also that uh, you do get some people got some relief of pain. Likewise, um, so um, summary: we got a good. We we studied pain. We focused on pain because that would we thought that was where the money was. We got uh, good results, um, encouraging, uh, even though the studies were small, uh, it, it was encouraging that we had investigators at many different sites across the state. And so it wasn't just that we had one <laughs> investigator, and one scientist that was particularly talented at doing these trials, or one group of patients that was particularly responsive, but uh, across a range of investigators and a range of illnesses and a, a range of just different geographic sites that made us say that hey there's there's something here there could be something here. Um, uh, I went through the literature and just tried to summarize what are some of the short-term uh, adverse effects of smoking cannabis and then in a second I'll just talk about 
uh, questions about longer term uh, effects. So of course, uh, uh, dizziness, dry mouth, um, some kind of muscle weakness, uh, muscle achiness are the most common side effects that people in clinical trials uh, all across the world have reported. Um, some small percentage of people get very anxious uh, with cannabis. Uh, uh, some people get high. Uh, a few get frankly paranoid, suspicious, just have a real bad response to cannabis. And of course these psychiatric side effects are the ones you'd like to minimize, so you'd like to keep the pain relieving effects and minimize the psychiatric and the other medical adverse effects. Um, so um, obviously smoking is difficult in many clinical settings. Uh, in cigarette smoke is, can't be good for you. So we, uh, um, we studied uh, delivery of cannabis by this, uh, by vaporization, by volcano. Um, uh, and uh, let me just show you what the, the result in terms of, of uh, uh, delivering cannabis by vaporizer or by smoking. Uh, these curves uh, show different concentrations of smoked cannabis uh, delivered by vaporizer or cigarette and you get, you get virtually the same blood concentrations with the vaporizer as you do with, uh, with smoking. And then uh, uh, the other nice thing about it, the carbon monoxide concentrations with the vaporizer are much, much lower because you're not actually burning the plant material, of course. So much lower carbon monoxide concentrations and uh, the same uh, quantity of uh, THC. And uh, so then we've, uh, we've done uh, now two studies uh, in diabetic neuropathy pain and then uh, uh, mixed nerve injury pain with the vaporizer and it looks like it does just as, as well as we did with smoked uh, uh, cannabis. So uh, let me just just finish up. Uh, um, uh, of course many different alternatives to, to uh, phytocannabinoids, plant cannabinoids. Uh, dronabinol, uh, uh, nabiximols, or Sativex is an oral spray that delivers uh, a, a plant-derived uh, extract, uh, cannabis plant extract, uh, under the tongue. Uh, it's been very effective in neuropathic pain. Uh, uh, there is a, a synthetic CB1 agonist or activator called uh, adulamic acid. It was uh, developed in Germany about 10 years ago. Uh, it is uh, very effective with neuropathic pain. Um, Rimondamant uh, was a CB1 kind of agonist antagonist. There were some adverse side effects in clinical trials early on, so that's been withdrawn from, from study. Um, so, um, I won't... Uh, We have a question over here. Sure. What specifically does it mean when you say synthetic for the that person on that last list? Like, what is? What do you mean when when it says synthetic? What specifically is that? that pills that are. Uh, so well, well with dronaminol, it's it's THC that's synthesized. Uh, tetrahydrocannabinol and with uh, this adulamic acid, it it's a molecule that looks like, well. It fools the body into thinking it's THC and, or anandamide and it attaches at the same receptors that THC attaches to. So it's just a dreamed up molecule that the structure looks pretty much the same. Is that, is that yeah, your yeah. question? So how long has that been used, discovered? This, um, I, uh, well, I've never heard of it since the paper was published 10 years ago in Germany. Uh, I don't know what happened to the compound. I would have thought it would have been dynamite and some big uh, pharmaceutical company might have picked it up. Well, Marinol is... Uh, yes. Well, the trouble with Marinol, um, I, I think there should be some trials of Marinol versus smoked cannabis or vaporized cannabis. Uh, the trouble with studying Marinol is that um, uh, 
Well, with smoking, you everybody is pretty much the same. Within 20 minutes, you have a maximum concentration of THC, and uh, depending on your metabolism, it'll kind of degrade pretty regularly, almost, almost everyone over uh, over the same time frame. With, uh, uh, with ingested THC or dronabinol, marinol, uh, uh, different people's uh, stomach and intestines absorb it in different rates and usually the rates vary between one hour and eight hours. So um, you just can't study something like that because nobody wants to sit around for eight hours for an effect to take place. And, and then uh, you know nobody wants to walk out thinking that fine, everything's good, I didn't have no effect, and then, you know, it hits them at the wrong time. So, um, uh, but it'd be interesting to do comparisons with the uh, Marinol against THC. It's just that it's, it's, uh, it's too messy to study in its current, current form. Um, maybe just a bit on health consequences. Uh, I gave this talk to the uh, uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, and uh, they are, of course, the people who are interested in pain like me and the people who are interested in addictions, we just don't speak the same language and we just don't get along uh, because the addiction community says that anybody in pain is faking it uh, and is a, you know, a drug abuser. And then, uh, of course, in the in the pain community, if you have a drug abuse problem, then you're allowed, and you know, it's, it's a mess. So anyway, they nearly ran me out, but uh, I tried to tell them, they told me all the bad things that cannabis does, and I tried to ask them to look at the evidence um, uh, of, of longer term health consequences. It hasn't been extensively studied, but um, the questions, I, I put question marks about where, where the data is. So on the left-hand panel, uh, the medical consequences, there have been concerns about more respiratory infections, uh, perhaps lung cancer, uh, or even heart attack. The, um, uh, you know, I don't doubt that if, so, uh, so to get lung cancer, you need to smoke roughly three packs of cigarettes for between 25 and 30 years on average. Uh, so three packs of cigarettes, is that th that's 36 cigarettes, something like that. So I don't doubt that it might be possible to get a cancer from just the combusted smoke from cannabis, but I just don't know who could smoke 36 <laughs> cigarettes a day. So... I'm willing to try. Are you going to try? <laughs> you're, not, you're not afraid. <laughs> so, um, I just, I don't see the, uh, I, there isn't good evidence that just consistently says that uh, uh, cannabis smokers are more likely to get lung cancer or oral cancers. Um, not more likely, definitely, to get respiratory infection. Uh, I don't see it couldn't happen. I just think it's tough to work your way into that much smoke. Um, the one thing is possible, uh, one fellow studied uh, heart attacks uh, uh, in, uh, in the city of Toronto over a two-year period and found that there were an excess number of heart attacks in, in people who had pre-existing heart disease. They'd, er they'd already had one heart attack. Uh, and then within an hour of smoking cannabis, their, ri their risk of a second heart attack was increased or another heart attack. And so you f I just wonder if that isn't because some people get uh, lowered blood pressure uh, on smoking. And I just wonder if their blood pressure dropped to kind of a level that was difficult for them because they already had a compromised uh, heart ability. And just, uh, so that's, that's the strongest evidence. Now, on the, the psychiatric side of things, it said that uh, um, for people who use uh, cannabis more than once monthly, the risk of dependence is about one out of every ten uh, people. Uh, of course, uh, fatal overdoses haven't been reported. Um, we got, we were very interested in the, uh, the effects of, uh, of long-term cannabis use in heavy amounts on uh, mental functioning like uh, uh, problem solving, rapid thinking, uh, 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 and 
when we looked at the world's literature, there's just no evidence that people who use even a ton of cannabis uh, have any mental decline over time. So I, um, uh, it could be there, it's just it isn't demonstrated. Um, there is concern, there was a famous paper published a couple years ago in a prestigious uh, British medical journal called The Lancet that said uh, individuals who smoke cannabis uh, heavily before age 14 are more likely than their, their twin who didn't smoke it to go on and develop schizophrenia. Uh, and then there were some follow-up studies with that and said very early uh, um, uh, smoking, heavy smoking of cannabis leads, slows down brain development in, uh, uh, in early preteen years and early teen years. Um, I just don't think that the evidence for, uh, I, I, the argument is that um, there may be a genetic vulnerability, so some people who are smoke cannabis very heavily at, at young age may be vulnerable to mental illness later that was contributed to by, uh, uh, by cannabis. I don't think that the data is that strong, honestly, but I can believe certainly that there is a genetic vulnerability to toxicity of anything and uh, um, so finally on the public health side of things um, in terms of traffic accidents uh, the literature on s uh, smoking cannabis and being involved in a fatal or non-fatal uh, traffic accident is um, is really murky for every positive study that says there's a link there's a negative study which fails to show one so I just uh, uh, I have to believe that you shouldn't drive when you're impaired, but it's from the uh, public health perspective, from you know statewide and national data, and data in Europe, it's very difficult to, to make the case that cannabis is a liability. Now, of course, there's no doubt that alcohol is a liability, and there's no doubt that the combination of alcohol and cannabis is much, much worse than alcohol alone. So that's from the traffic accident data, that's, that's quite clear. Um, and then there are questions about, well, does, um, uh, does cannabis harm the newborn or might someone who is in, uh, uh, as a uh, developing fetus, as they were exposed to cannabis, could they show up with problems at age 10, 11, 12, 13, 14? Uh, those are questions of interest. I just don't know that the data uh, there shows the link. So where do we go from here? Um, well, ideally, we'd compare cannabis to uh, Marinol or other synthetic uh, 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 agents. Uh, ideally, the uh, pharmaceutical companies would get interested in uh, uh, developing cannabinoid compounds that gave you the pain relief without the the side effects, so that's the that's the the, the hope or the dream. But uh, you know, there's just no no support at the federal level for this kind of research. Um, you, you saw what we went through to get each of our protocols approved, and uh, that was fine. Everybody was cordial, but you know, most people aren't going to want to fiddle around for a year, or year and a half to get their research funded. And so it's just a you know, it's just not a supportive environment. Some people enjoy the side effects. Well, some people enjoy the side effects. Yes, that's, that's right. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, as I said, the CB1 receptors are spread all 